Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode zero of Mark Experience's uh, very first D&D campaign on our actual play show. We're finally a proper D&D uh, podcast, you guys. <laughs> Only took us, what, uh, two and a half years or whatever? Yeah, um, I felt a little bit bad about putting uh, 20 minutes of world building and lore explanation at the beginning of Bypass System, so we're not going to do that again um, in the future. I will be striving to set up episode zeros uh, for all of the seasons and the campaigns that I'm in charge of. If you're not interested in hearing a brief synopsis, um, some world building, an overview about what the cultures are and what characters uh, the players will be playing. Um, this isn't for you and you don't have to listen to it. It's not mandatory and that's totally okay. Um, we are going to be playing a and d campaign called Pillar Arisen um, that is in my own setting um, on the world of Almora. Uh, we will be playing mostly on uh, one continent called Taurus. Uh, basically, the concept of the game is that this is the aftermath of a uh, evil campaign. Um, basically, what happened was a team of evil adventurers um, went into hell and uh, killed as Modius, and they set themselves up as the new rulers of hell, and... Uh, they engaged uh, in this massive war that c killed almost all of the remaining gods uh, in this world, and the ones that weren't killed, uh, that weren't killed, they fled. Um, and the war was so massive and so destructive that it basically uh, completely uh, changed the landscape and altered how almost every single culture functions. So if you're here for classic Tolkien-style uh, dwarves, orcs, and elves, uh, I'm afraid we're not going to have that. Uh, hey, all stop of the telling races. our fans to go away. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Tell them what we're there want... here for. Yeah. Um, if you like unique cultures, if you like sky dwarves that mine lightning out of clouds. Um, Hell yeah. If you like party elves. And if yes. you like... Um, Unique, mysterious gods and a uh, a like a fallen post-apocalypse fantasy setting. Then this is uh, definitely going to be a fun D and D game for you if you're you've been less interested in our other seasons because we've been playing games that you haven't heard of or haven't played before. Um, we're playing D and D, which I think uh, most people that play uh, actual play podcasts on their phone uh, will recognize. Um, so basically, uh, we're on, uh, we're going to be on one of the main continents on the planet, which is Taurus, uh, and on Taurus there are, like, six main factions. I'm just going to go over some world building stuff and everything, and then we'll introduce everybody's characters. Um, the two biggest and main kingdoms are the Kingdom of Libertina, which is, um, this large uh camelot-esque um like paladin filled um sword and sorcery lawful good um big nation uh well i say lawful good um and they kind of are positioned as the camelot of this world and they take up a large portion of the north and their rivals which is grayscale which is a kingdom founded by a collection of dragons um, takes up a large portion of the South. And both of these two kingdoms blame each other for the war and the death of all the gods and hell being under new management. Both claim that it was the other one's fault. I would like to say that essentially the one that Riley keeps going saying, oh, this is the camel of the world is just Riley being home is Arthurian night bullshit. Yeah, I... I I am a very big <laughs> fan of Arthurian lore and Camelot and stuff. So if you like <laughs> takes of King Arthur and Guinevere, but maybe Guinevere is a big hot orc lady, um, that's here. That's what this is. Um, in the center of the continent, we have the Orchard Diaspora. Um, 
the Orchard Diaspora was founded by halflings who lost their home. Um, if you want to think about it, imagine if the Shire exploded one day and halflings uh, had to move elsewhere and figure out a whole new culture and everything. Um, there was this big, horrible cataclysm. Um, the halfling home of Orchard was completely destroyed, leaving this massive pit in the continent that just goes straight down um, and killed all of the plant life and the farmlands in the surrounding area uh, uh, in the center of the continent, which is one of the main reasons why Libertina and Grayscale haven't just full-on gone to war, because there's this big, like, scarred area in the middle of the continent that makes it difficult to travel that is full of very, very angry halflings. Um, <laughs> they have, they've formed a nomadic uh, society where they live with gnolls, goblins, and centaurs, and they all live together in this big orchard diaspora because they all lost something really important to them in the war um, and don't have a home anymore. And so they've banded together and uh, roam the deserts uh, of the center of the continent and uh, work together to help all these cultures survive. Um, up north past Libertina, we have Refuge, which is the new home of dwarves and gnomes. Um, the war made the Underdark even more notoriously uh, uninhabitable than it is in normal D&D lore. And so, basically, as a whole, the world decided that it was just better to seal off the entirety of the Underdark and leave it be. So, dwarves, gnomes, and all of the other subterranean races like the drow and uh, kobolds, everything like that, they all left um, and moved up as far as they could. The dwarves and the gnomes basically climbed up these mountains, but they were so terrified of what lay beneath their feet that once they reached the top of the mountains, they felt that they had to keep going. And they formed a new skyfaring society uh, with other, like, bird folk, um, like Aarakocra and Kenku and other um, smart races that were willing to lend their magic and their know-how uh, to others in order to escape the war-torn planet below. And so they formed the city of the Nation of Refuge. Um, other than that, we just have the Feyborn city-states, which are a collection of these massive walled-off city-states, uh, founded by the elves. Um, when the war started, uh, and got particularly bad, the high elves and their isolationist, uh, isolationist policies, um, leaked to the other elves, and they convinced elf society as a whole to stay out of the war and just go into these massive citadels that they built for themselves, build these massive walls, and just wall themselves off from the rest of the world for all eternity. Um, as they were escaping, um, other races from uh, the Feywild, or that are descended from the Feywild, uh, begged to be taken along with them, like satyrs and... Uh, uh, Fairbolgs and other races like that, and they convinced the elves to take them with them, and now they live in these series of these massive citadels that um, almost no one ever leaves. Um, and then the last faction on our map is in the very south in a series of red tropical islands called the Red Isles, um, which are a series of small tropical islands that sit in a blood-red ocean that sits on a torn area of the plain that leaks uh, demons and devils from hell um, on a constant basis. Think uh, Japan with kaiju. Uh, this is fantasy like Japan, except instead of Godzilla, it's like Orcus um, bursting from the waters with an army of undead. Um, and so uh, a, a huge portion of the tiefling population moved to the Red Isles, half of them to stick it to their fiendish heritage and fight back their parents, and the other half to support their fiendish heritage and help their demon daddies uh, into the material plane to mess stuff up. Don't say it like that. And they live a endless weird <laughs> war against the Hellkaiju. Riley, Riley, don't say it like that. No, I'm saying it exactly like that. <laughs> no! Why must you hurt me in this way? So those are the main six nations. Uh, Libertina and uh, Grayscale are the two big ones. Um, 
that we're going to be focusing on. Uh, the party has decided that they would like to start in the Dragon Run Nation of Grayscale. So we'll be starting in a city named Xandria that is on the border of Grayscale and the Red Isles. So that's where we'll be uh, starting. As for the gods of this world, um, the Pantheon looks almost entirely different. Uh, the entirety of the world all worships one patchwork pantheon that has been formed out of the nine surviving gods that have been left over after the war. Um, and as a side effect of these gods being promoted to greater gods because there's literally no one else, um, them absorbing the domains of different fallen deities and them being worshipped by every culture and every race, they have all become incredibly powerful um, so much so that they can interfere on the material plane actively as much as they want. Um, but also they become incredibly mercurial, where each different nation has a different way that they see the gods, and the gods have different ways of appearing to their followers uh, to those. So, like, the elves may worship one god as an elf, where the halflings might see that god as a halfling, and both versions are accurate. Um the Pantheon, the, uh, as it exists now, is Godric, who is the god of war, heroes, and strength. Uh, Sylph, who is the god of nature, music, uh, passion, and uh, fairies. Osmaldus, who is the god of sky, travel, and knowledge. The Couple, which is uh, a married conglomerate deity that represents uh, love, family, uh, civilization, and fertility. Uh, the two goddesses of magic, Corinda, who represents magic and uh, order, uh, magic as a uh, arcane science and as a force that uh, you break down and use to bring order to the world, and then Mariella, who represents magic as um, a force of nature that cannot be controlled, uh, destruction, chaos, um, the world as a place where volcanoes erupt and... Um, forests move around uh, all sorts of stuff like that that's what they represent um the god of the sun is named halo and the god of the moon uh the moon and the ocean is named arwell um and the very last god and the newest god um who's only been alive for 300 years is the young child god of death enoch who is the son of Mariella and was recently born to take over the death domain after the last god of death that survived the war finally perished from their wounds that they suffered. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, the gods are a very big, important part of this setting, and so we will be talking about which gods the different um, players uh, subscribe to and how they feel about them. Uh, past that, um, we're also using a different custom-made cosmology uh, that I wrote by myself. Um, it's very similar to uh, Yggdrasil or the World Tree. Um, basically, the way that Almora views the planes is that all planes are stacked on top of each other in this giant massive pillar or tower, similar to the world tree, with um, the material plane at the very center. And then as you move up, uh, the planes uh, give way to more positive energy and celestial beings and uh, beings that are metaphors and uh, like uh, elemental that represent things in the world like gravity or fire. And then as you go down, um, you go into the planes that are um, influenced by negative energy and the breaking down of concepts. Like you get the shadow fell, um, you get uh, like the afterlife and hell and everything at the very, very bottom. Okay. I think that's all of the really brief basics and it's only been 14 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Oh, yes. And for the listeners, yes, this is the brief version. We have the documents all in front of us. We've skipped over maybe 15 documents. Yeah. Mm. I did my very best to be very brief and simplistic, and I know that Jamie is going to work her editing magic and make it all make sense and sound good. <laughs> I mean, you did the best you could, considering you yeah. made this. <laughs> I... Getting... 
I gave myself two challenges for this. Is one, I wanted every single published playable race by Wizards of the Coast to be playable in this world, so that no matter what, whatever my players came to uh, with me and said I would like to play this race, it would be allowed. Um, and two, I did not want to use established D and D lore um, because D and D lore is kind of like it. I love D and D, but sometimes D and D and D lore can be dumb. <laughs> Riley um, sent a message saying, guys, D&D lore is, like, bad because of how messy it is. <laughs> there's there's yeah. so many planes. I can't wait for the lunch break. We should just have we should just have a section of the lunch break that's Riley ranting about D&D lore. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> let me tell you. Let me tell you about the Orc Pantheon and how it's half Gods of War. Oh, my gosh. Or war equivalents. <laughs> Not right now. That's for the lunch break. He ran, he already ranted to me about the orcish gods, and it went on for an hour. It's very frustrating. It's fine. Um, there are too <laughs> many planes. That's fine. Um, anyway. Um, okay. Do you guys want to roll initiative for who introduces their character first? Okay. Oh, damn. Does that okay. sound fun? You yeah, know what I sure. forgot? Dice. <laughs> <laughs> me pulling out my dice. I would also like to say... Um, we all started playing tabletop games through D and D. I think just like um most people that play D and D was our introduction, um and it was one of the games that I actually DM the most, and I like I feel <laughs> that I know how to run really well. So in in a way, we're going to something that makes us all like that we all understand and makes us like comfortable. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Guys, guys, I rolled a nat twenty. <gasps> nice. Oh shit! Okay. First roll of the day. That's fantastic. Jamie, would you like to introduce your character? <laughs> I was like, Jamie's going first. I'm, okay. I am playing Kaya. She is a level three paladin, and she is a centaur. She is an Oath of the Watchers. She fo- Because of that, she follows um, Osmaldus, the god of traveling and knowledge and whatnot. And she keeps track of all the demons and whatnot coming through. Um... I'm lawful neutral, etc. What else should I say about her? Um, well, description clearly. Um, <laughs> we can just talk a little bit about a little uh, bit of like what Kaya looks like, and then we can talk about the god that okay. you worship. Um, so Kaya is a very large black stallion type horse, and she is very beautiful, dark skin. She has shaved her head, and she has. Uh, golden tattoos in the back of her head going down in this swirling pattern down to her down her spine down her back into a multi-winged bird on her back and she also wears a a, not it's not full gold because gold doesn't really protect you that well but it has gold in it. You can tell because it's like a has a gold machine to it. She has chainmail that is slightly yellowish gold that allows her to be able to show the tattoo on her back while still covering everything important up front. <laughs> Should I say why she's out here? Yeah, uh, let's go over Kaya's backstory. Um, so Kaya is out here with the other two characters because uh, she actually had a very interesting background if i could have chosen two literal meta backgrounds for her it would be acolyte and some kind of guard background but you can only choose one so she's an acolyte um but first of all she wanted to protect people she wanted to uh, be a guard she wanted to train she's very physical so she became a hired guard and she would uh, go on to hired missions to protect important people This was especially important because you're from the diaspora. Yeah. So after a bit, she's like, this is great and all, but it's not hitting all of the points that I want in my life. I don't feel satisfied. So she decided to become a scholar. And she went to a school. She learned a lot about different subjects and gods and all that. And it was great. Until a demon came along and burned the entire school down along with some of her friends. Mm, Beautiful. So, yeah. And then, (laughs) I I joke about this, but it might also be in-world real, but she just saw 
Osvaldus fly across the sky like ho oh in the first episode of Pokemon. <laughs> it was oh, like, no. that bird. <laughs> that bird knows what's up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, with Osvaldus uh, stopping all of those creatures from coming through to other worlds, one of them being the ones that burned down her school. She want, she put two and two together of both of her backgrounds of knowledge and fighting. And she is traveling the world trying to learn more and protect knowledge. And people count as knowledge. So she's trying to protect people when she can as she travels. Yeah. She's so good. She is also still a hired guard. <laughs> she's so good compared to our bastard boys, really. Yeah. Um... Osmaldus is generally depicted to be this massive snow white bird with blazing blue eyes and um, depending on who you ask, either six or eight wings. Um, it's just this big, massive, uh, legendary creature that uh, flies across the sky um, and represents um, knowledge uh, of the sense of going out there, seeing and, and uh, seeing things and experiencing them for yourself. Um the Church of Osmaldus has this myth where, according to them, Osmaldus was originally a primordial air elemental that lived um, in the elemental chaos, and during the war, tore open a portal through the plains, and t uh, its city, Cumulus, fell through, which is now the citadel, uh, the nation capital of refuge. Um, and because of that, and because Osmaldus being an extra planar creature originally, that understands the dangers of what the rest of the pill, the rest of the layers of the pillar represent. Osmaldus is very firmly against creatures from other planes interfering um, with the material plane, like elementals, uh, fae, fiends, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, and that is the god that you follow. Yeah! And I have a reason for following him. Oh, also, um, all of the gods in this world have, uh, because they're, wor they're worshipped and so mercurial, um, all of the gods have different gendered aspects as well, where they will usually, but not always, appear to different people with different genders and, and uh like, things that match their followers, though not necessarily. For instance, like, Kaya, like, sees Osmaldus as male for her, so Osmaldus appears as a male for her. Um, uh, no, I didn't say that. Oh, I thought you said him. I, yeah, no, Kaya sees Osmaldus as not having a gender, because she mm -hmm. sees them as ha as being knowledge. Okay, there you go. genderless. Yeah. Okay, so, like, for instance, in Kaya, that's on me, um, in Kaya's particular instance, uh, Osmaldus does not have a gender, which I, I would argue none of the gods have, a like, a true, actual gender, except for the ones that generally choose to mm -hmm. appear and be represented in a certain way. Um, yeah, there are some people who would, like, prefer to be confronted by a female over a male and whatnot. Like, the two gods of- That's my favorite word yeah. today. <laughs> the, what not? The two gods of magic, for instance, are all, are usually going to be portrayed as uh, feminine uh, in using she, her pronouns. But um, not necessarily always, just a majority of the time, uh, depending on who follows them and what they believe and how they see the deity. Um, who rolled second highest? I'm so sorry. Uh, what? So are we just doing a flat roll? Yeah, just a flat roll. Okay, uh... I got a seven, so... Oh no, Rowan. Oh no! I got a nine, so that's why I was asking. Right, okay, Reese, go. <laughs> Reese, introduce your character. Okay! <laughs> so, I am playing a level three bard named Lois. Um, this is the first time I've ever played a bard. Uh, <laughs> what race and subclass are you? He is a, uh, just a male human, just... Um, and the subclass is, uh, College of Glamour, which is essentially, you learn your music slash magic from the Fae, or you want to be a pop star. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, he is chaotic neutral. <laughs> um, and who is the god that you mostly subscribe to? He mostly subscribes to Sylph, um... And Do you want to get into your backstory a little bit there? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Lois is trying to be 
a pop star. He calls himself, for those he's trying to be the pop star of the world, Lucky Starlight. Um, I, but I was, I, okay, for the audience, I was fully not aware that Reese had prepared a pop star pseudonym <laughs> for their D&D character. And <laughs> I have been fully obliterated. I asked y'all, hey, which one sounds like a good one? <laughs> I said it in the chat, but I'm Lucky dying. Starlight. <laughs> but his background is charlatan, uh, because he was kind of the street musicians that would swindle you and hustle you for all your money is worth. If I was able to pick more than one background, I would also pick street urchin, but I'm not, so I chose charlatan. Um, and essentially, what happened was around the age of fifteen or sixteen. He saw this very gorgeous fae, and he tried to swindle them. And then it turned out that this was not just regular fae. This was, this was Sylph. <laughs> he done made a bad move. Um, Sylph is the, uh, is the, uh, deity of nature, um, music, and strong emotions, um, they generally appear as this winged archfey of like this beautiful um, mercurial figure that has these huge, uh, wonderful butterfly or moth wings and these uh, long antenna that they've kind of swept back and formed like a laurel crown. Um, the the Church of Sylph has a myth where, according to them. Um, Sylph was originally a minor archfey that served in the court of the Elvish Pantheon. And uh, for whatever reason, when the Elvish Pantheon was killed and slain and the survivors fled, um, Sylph was unharmed and very quickly absorbed their domains and rose to godhood. And as such, Sylph is also worshipped as the god of ambition. Um, th if you want to think about, like, a shorthand for them, think about uh, a mix between Aphrodite from Greek mythology and Loki from Norse mythology. Um, that's kind of their deal. Um, but essentially after this, Sylph kind of was like, that's a bad move. S Sylph admired the hustle, but also, um... Trying to con a deity is never, like, a cool, smart decision you made. Um, yeah, and kind of just adopted him, <laughs> essentially. Yeah, and uh, of. ever since then, uh, Lois has been receiving music and um, con man lessons from various fae that um, Sylph sends uh, his way. I, do you want the description of Lois now? <laughs> Please tell me what this pop star looks like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Lois has uh, somewhat tan skin uh, with freckles across the bridge of his nose. Uh, his hair is a very... Um, when someone's dyed their blonde hair purple, but it's fading back to the blonde a bit, but it's still purple. Lavender. Thank you, my mind, but it's not exactly that, because it, like, still has some of the blonde. So, it, it looks kind of weird. It's like a kind of a gradient. That's the best way I can describe it. In a very long braid, he has, uh, large hoop earrings and golden, like, and golden necklaces. He has an eyebrow piercing, and he very, is very much in touch with his feminine side and doesn't care. He likes being a pretty boy. Yeah. Rowan, would you like to introduce your character? All right. Um, I am playing a uh, a moon elf, which is a subset of high elf, a moon elf rogue named Jerusalem Estierel. And um, Jerusalem, I'm going to pronounce your last name wrong a lot, and I'm sorry. It's spelled like how it sounds: S T E R L. S T E R L. Okay. Yes. Um. And Jerusalem comes from a family that basically runs a lot like the Mafia. Um, there are very rich noble families, so his background is the noble. Um, and they, they've they built kind of a, a lot of 
businesses that they they kind of own the the names or s- stocks in um and they're they're a very successful family and they keep a lot of their success um doing some kind of shady business as well uh some assassinations some bribery all that stuff on the down low and because of that the SDRO family is very much about loyalty to each other um they have to make sure everyone's on board so they can keep their secrets and make sure they know who to trust if you hurt any of them it hurts like they're they're they'll hold a grudge against anyone forever if you hurt anyone in their family dope um jerusalem is lawful evil oh boy and that's actually not because of the mafia background it's just jerusalem jerusalem happens to have kind of a god complex oh no oh boy um where he thinks the world revolves around him and that he is the most important and that he deserves everything the funny thing is most of his family is not like that (laughs) it's just him um and because of that his family, the STRO family, is aligned with the couple because connection and family is so important to them. Having this close knit tie with the other members of their family, um, so he's also sort of aligned with the couple. He sees the couple very much as like parents. Um, I don't know if he's had any actual interaction with the couple, but that's just how he would perceive yeah. them, like. Yeah. Um, what does Jerusalem look like? I don't think we got this with Lois either. I would love a character description of both of you. Jerusalem is, uh, so he's a moon elf, so he has a lot of, like, blue tones. He's got kind of, like, light gray, bluish skin. Uh, his eyes are dark blue. His hair is, like, steely, steely gray. Um, he wears a lot of nice clothing. Um, yeah, and, oh, here's another thing I forgot to mention. Uh, his, his goal is to gain a bunch of wealth, but steal, petty thievery is not the way to do it. (laughs) He's, he's out for a big cash grab. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Um, sounds about right. Should I explain why? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we'll probably also cover this in episode one as well. Um, The SDRO family has a big family fortune, and it goes to whoever has the most money at the time. So currently, that is Jerusalem's parents. And um, whenever they decide that they don't want to manage the family fortune anymore, they'll pass it on to whoever has the next largest fortune, so they can keep adding to the to the the overall inheritance. Um, as of that, Jerusalem is not even close to being next in line. He's got two older siblings and an uncle who are in line before him. And actually, I drew out the family tree. tree. There's also some cousins plus uh, grandparents who would be in line before Jerusalem. Purely because... Which is pretty unusual for elves, since elves have such a, like, a low birth rate. Yeah, well, they have a low birth rate, but, like, they don't die that quickly, so there's a decent yeah, amount they of... they generally live around, like, yeah. 800 years. There's a decent in, amount uh, of grandparents. In, yeah. The only reason Jerusalem is so far, uh, like, so far off the list of who's going to get the inheritance next is because n- they no one thinks he's responsible enough to take care of the fortune. He doesn't have mm-hmm. very much fortune right now, and yes, that's, like, their whole thing, but he knows that even if he were to get the money, he'd have to do something else to prove his worth. Like, he'd have to go above and beyond. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Hmm. But he still thinks he deserves it. He just thinks they're being <laughs> unreasonable. <laughs> hmm. Uh um and a real quick description of the couple um the couple are, is this uh du- a pair of dual gods that uh have, are so inseparable that they basically become one and are like known as one um 
like as I said earlier, they are the deity that represents uh, love, family, civilization, and uh, fertility. Um, the myth of their church is that originally they were two minor gods in different pantheons, um, and when their original families were killed or uh, or, or left. Um, they found each other in the in the results and fell in love and um, decided to be together despite being from different uh, pantheons originally. Um, uh, and basically, the co the concept of this adventuring party is it's a small um, adventuring guild slash business that Jerusalem has started in order to make money. Um, and Lois and Kaya is are Jerusalem's employees. And you've meet, recently moved into the city of Z uh, Zandria, uh, which is a grayscale city um, near the Red Isles. Because it is this massive port city near the ocean, it gets a bunch of trade from the Red Isles, and it's like a great spot to find work for people that fancy themselves to be adventurers. Um, and... As for like the the state of the world as it is, um, imagine this uh, this massive uh, continent filled with like these six major kingdoms that almost every single race subscribes to. Um, each race's culture has been radically changed and altered by um, this war that's left these ruins uh, across the continent that are now these uh, these incredible dungeons um, for various adventurers to dive into and uh, strip for all their worth. Um, and when exactly we pick up, what we're gonna do. <laughs> which is exactly yeah. what you're going to do. Um, and so when we pick up, uh, the world will be going through yet another massive undertaking in the wake of this giant, um, not an undertaking, but another massive change in the wake of this massive war um, that is going to put all of the factions at odds against each other as the gods start making moves um, to change the world. Sounds so cool. Lovely. A little yeah. concerned about that, but but it's cool. It's cool. I uh, I don't know if I want this in the recording, but I will say, uh, Reese, I already told you what it was that uh, is going to be the main thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what? Like, if y'all don't want spoilers, just like plug your ears real quick, I guess. But um, <laughs> it's going to be revealed in episode one really soon, anyway. But um, very recently. It was revealed that um, the deity Sylph had a, a dalliance. Uh, dalliance? Dalliance? Uh, anyway, um, she uh, and a demon lord uh, <laughs> got together and um, had a child, and that child is a brand new race of sapient, uh, four foot tall moth people. Um, that are now just in the world, <laughs> um, and no gotta one love, is no one is happy about it. <laughs> gotta love Lois's adoptive mom, um, creating a whole new yeah. thing, a whole new race. Yeah, Sylph decided to create a whole new race. Um, and also, there's like, there's gonna. <laughs> There's going to be, like, weird breakup drama between Sylph and the Demon Lord. It's going to be great. It's fine. Yes! <laughs> um, so, yeah, that'll be where things start. Oh, my gosh, we forgot your frog butler. Uh, oh, yeah! Oh, no, it's, it's fine um, for the audience. Um, uh, Jerusalem has a frog butler, and I, which has I been provided that was not something by I their family. <laughs> Okay, I think that's everything. Uh, I don't know. Is there anything else yeah. we want to... We went over the factions. Um, do we want to do some meta-knowledge on our characters? Or... I don't know if any sure, of our what fans are, you thinking are of? very... Like, more into the technical side of D&D. &D. Um, are you going to talk about your con? 
in no, your head. Yeah. I mean, I figured we could bring up the fact that we're starting at level three, and yeah, well, yeah, yeah but uh, please tell us about your health. Please. Everyone's getting on my case because my level three rogue only has um. 17 hit points. It's so bad. It's so, it is so, so bad. bad. It's a joke. I'm gonna murder you so fast. <laughs> anyway. Uh, like, <laughs> I have 34. I literally have double what you have. I have, uh, I think it's 21. Let me double check. 21, yeah. 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 At least both, of, both Jamie and I have healing. Yeah, we're gonna be keeping you yep, alive. I'm ready to roll those death saves. But I can't. <laughs> I can't say it is a hundred percent in character for Lois to do that because he has. He is going to make sure his investment on Jerusalem to get that money is is still there. Yeah. Do we want to go over how everyone met, or are we doing that in the first episode? How did we? Meet? That would be a good. Yeah, let's go over how you you guys met. Okay. Like, with Jerusalem and Kaya, I feel like Kaya was probably hired for a few uh, family things, family meetings and all that. Just like, so Jerusalem kind of knew Kaya through assimilation. Yeah, I think um, the easiest way to connect the two would be through Jerusalem. Um, yeah. Jerusalem likely met Kaya as a bodyguard for um, his parents at some point. Like your parents, yeah. Uh, I'd say Jerusalem probably met... Um, uh, met Lois just Lois. out on the streets. <laughs> <laughs> and Lois did his... Ten. Tried to grift each other. <laughs> Had to send a one by one. One on one. <laughs> and Lois probably started his whole, um, like, con man spiel and then realized that, like, he could get a whole lot more out of Jerusalem. Honestly, yeah. Instead of stealing him for all his money's worth, I will befriend him and then steal him <laughs> for all his money's worth. Hey, hey man, give me your money. Oh, you don't have money? Oh, you want money? I want money too. Let's go get money. Okay, yeah, but he wouldn't do it that. He's a much more charismatic. <laughs> I'm just saying, that's the basic of what happened. Yeah, yeah, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. That's overall essentially what hey, happened. Hey man, hey. You want money. I want money. I I want want money. money. We've got so much in common. Kai is yeah. the only one out here that doesn't want money. <laughs> she's just in it for the knowledge, yeah. and she's with you. Kai is here to whack you two with a newspaper. <laughs> Going back to uh, mechanics and whatnot, uh, Kaya is... Car- she's packing a lot. Um, she's carrying a two-handed glaive, a scimitar, and five javelins. Uh, Lois has <laughs> several things. He carries so much on his person. He has, um, he has his Aurora, his instrument of choice. Um, and no, I'm not saying what that is because I haven't figured it out yet. I should, but I haven't. You named it, but you don't know what it is. Yeah, when you when you said instrument of choice, my first initial thought was your dick. Hey, no, no. <laughs> No, he has more class than that. He's not gonna name his dick. <laughs> he was he was practically raised by Sylph. That but, he has but more. Reese, you're a bard. Yeah, that's why he's called <laughs> Lucky Starlight. And he, I forgot to add in his description, he has like little star pattern. Like I don't know if it's makeup or tattoos on his face, on like his cheeks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he has, like, freckles on his shoulders and all that. Like, the freckles are natural. He got stuff on his face that he, like, put there. I don't know if it's tattooed or what, but... I mean, cool. Kaya's down with tattoos. She's got tattoos. Okay. Is there anything else anyone has to go over or would like to? Does anyone have any questions? Uh... How are we... I mean... Is there anything we need to prep before we start the next session? Like, um, are we going to be planning what we're doing? Will you have a quest ready I for us? I will have a quest you- ready okay. for uh, us. Um, when we start in episode one, you will be new arrivals into the city of Xandria. Um, and you will have already set up your small guild. Um, and I will let you guys describe what you want your base of operations to look like. Um... And I will have. We have a base. Um, 
Yeah, a small base. You have a very tiny guild hall that you were you were able to buy. Um, you've you've just arrived in town relatively recently. Um, I am gonna have uh, uh, you know some scenes where I introduce the characters, their contacts, what their like deal is, and then I will be introducing like our very first uh, little quest. Um, I just want to go over uh, the the pillar one more time and uh, in a little bit more in depth, and then we can wrap up and be done. Okay, so like I said uh, before, um, the people of the this world view the planar system um, uh, similar to the world tree, uh, where they think of all of the different planes of reality as stacked on top of each other and layered. Um, in this massive big pillar where each different plane is a layer or a floor of the pillar. Um, and at the very center, you have the prime material plane, also known as Almora. Um, and if you go up, you reach the realm of Fae, which is uh, which people who know D&D lore recognize as the Fae Wild. This is a reflection of of the material plane that's more um, magical and strange and mysterious. Um, it's a little bit more influenced by positive energy in the uh, strong and strong emotions. Um, and the beings, while they're not full conceptual beings, they're like the the people and creatures that are born in the fae, in the realm of fae are like half metaphors. Where there are archfey that represent things, and while they're not technically gods or elementals that fully embody these ideas, um, they're still representatives of them. For it, so the, there's like fey that represents summer and um, all sorts of things, and there's like a ladder that can change their forms between the different seasons, um, and they're like beings that uh, are more in tune with uh, representing emotions or types of magic than like a human being which is just like a fully physical non-representative being above the realm of fey is the realm of ideals which is a realm of full metaphor beings that are still like simple and are not like entirely grand but are is also more influenced by like positive strong magical energy um so this entire plane is broken up into these different like nations and lands that are all representative of different elements and things that make up the world. So it's kind of like the elemental chaos in that respect where um, there's an area that's just fire. There's an area that's just about wind. There's an area that's just about earth. There's an area that's just about water. It's a lot like the elemental chaos like that. Um, they have the semi-elemental uh, and the quasi-elemental realms inside, where like there's a realm of, that is ash and that represents ash and smoke. There's a realm of ice. There's a realm of like lava and magma. There's a realm of ooze and mud and slime and stuff like that. And then you, as you go deeper towards the center, you get more and more specific. Uh, realms and uh, beings that are like full metaphors like the realm of steam the realm of lightning the realm of salt the realm of minerals etc and then once you reach the very center they're the realms that are like gravity elementals a uh, law elementals chaos elementals um light elementals beings that represent such fundamental specific like physics of how the world works that they're elementals of things that are like more specific than just like the average elementals that you get in what D, &D gives you and then above that is the realm that is simply just referred to as the highest which is the celestial plane which is the realm of, of full positive energy and beings that represent massive complex ideas and domains that they stand in for and that they represent fully which would be the gods um and each god has a different realm inside of the highest where they've made their own personal heaven um that uh each god uh in has their own angels and their own divine celestial servants and when a beloved mortal 
of a god dies and is sent to the afterlife to be judged by Enoch, um, a god will step in and, uh, like, root for them and ask for them, and then that soul will be sent up to that deity's specific realm of the highest. And these realms are always interacting with each other, exchanging angels, exchanging spirits of, like, good mortals and, and stuff like that all the time. Um, and that's what going up on the pillar looks like. Um, and heading down uh, from Almora, you get the Realm of Shadow, which is known in like D&D lore as the Shadowfell. Um, this is like a darker, more pale reflection of Almora and the Material Plane. That is being, it's the Material Plane, but a little bit more tilted towards negative energy, the lack of life, and beings that are like that aren't conceptual and are being broken down by that so this is where you get things that are like not true representative of what they are like monsters that are like two animals like smashed together like this is where owl bears come from this is where undead come from this is where the curse of lycanthropy like where werewolves come from because these curses of like lycanthropy and vampirism break down what you are conceptually as a mortal um, being. Um, underneath the realm of shadow is the realm of death, also known as the realm of the afterlife. Um, this is a dark, empty plane that it fully is representative of like the lack of energy and the lack of life. Um, this is where the young child god Enoch looks after the dead. When you die, your soul goes to the realm of death and Enoch uh, judges you um, because Enoch is a very young, very uh, like baby deity. Um, Enoch is not known as a harsh judge or um, like a like a punisher of souls. Um, you when you die, you go, you hang out in the void with a, a baby. That's what happens in this world. Um, if you were particularly good or beloved by a certain god, they will come down and they will get you. Um, if you're done living and you would like to be done and dead, uh, but you haven't been chosen by a god, you reside in the realm of the afterlife as a spirit with Enoch for the rest of eternity. If you would like to continue living and you want to go, uh, Enoch uh, reincarnates you and you are born again on the material plane and you get to keep going um, without memories of your previous life. Um, if you're really, really bad, if you were truly just a terrible person, or you have pissed off a god in particular, Enoch will hurl you down a layer into the realm that is simply referred to as the lowest. Um, this is the plane that is fully representative of negative um, energy, non-conceptual beings. Um, this is like hell. This is where fiends are from. This is like, this is where the devils live, the demons live, and the Yugoloths live. Um, in this horrible, like, nightmare space that is constantly always sending these forces on this river of blood up the pillar. They're constantly climbing the pillar, trying to reach the highest and tear them down. Mm, that's beautiful. I'll be honest, I got so into your, like, just storytelling that I forgot we were even recording or in a call <laughs> until Reese made a noise and I was like, oh, right, we're doing a show. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, I am, myself uh, am very interested in extra planar D&D. Oh, also, just very briefly, um, the ethereal plane also exists in this world as like a layer of the pillar that overlaps all of them and the astral plane exists outside of the pillar so those two areas do exist too because by D, &D laws they have to or else some spells just don't work they don't make sense i will say the plane of the plane of ooze not existing makes me sad no the plane of ooze exists reason. it's just not a plane it does. it's just a, it's just a space in the realm of ideals it is okay. It is the it is the area of the realm of ideals that represents the ideal of mud, ooze, slime, that sort of stuff. Okay, I for personal reasons I I, I wanted it there, <laughs> so I'm glad. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, personally, just me. I'm really interested in extra planar D and D, and so I wanted the cosmology and the different planes to be 
uh, very important to the world and be a thing that the players could interact with. So literally all of the worlds are layered on top of each other in, in like a game of like um, shoots and ladders where each world has thin points where you can slip down to the plane below or the plane above. Um, like climbing or, or descending a ladder, but like a game of shoots and ladders, different planes will have very specific shortcuts where if you take a wrong turn on the material plane, you might drop right past the Shadowfell and right past the Realm of Death and just into the, the lowest, and you did bad. Or Vibe check! Mm -hmm, yeah. Or uh, similar to going up, um, you know, if you go into the right area of the Fey, maybe you skip right over the Realm of Ideas and you just ride right up into the highest. Uh, stuff like You've that. You've passed the vibe check. Yeah. Um, it's uh, like a matter of geography and like literally moving up and down um, this big tube of worlds. Nice. I will say I'm very, like, I, I already said I'm excited, but now that we have more information, I'm very excited. I'm glad. I've been working really hard on world building for you guys, and this is the this is the summed up, like, broken down version. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I'm, I know, you give us all these documents, and then we never end up reading them. <laughs> because they're so long! They're, they're, they're most, they're for me. They're for my notes. Yeah. Um, you, you set up for... A huge campaign. This is not a one shot. It is. It is not a one shot. It never was a one shot. Yeah, yeah I, was like, I, I know, but it's not going to be short in general. No, no. Um, we, I didn't expect it. It's Riley. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's Riley. I, Nothing's I ever short. I always set up my campaigns to be multiple seasons. So if we ever get tired of it, like it, I know they're long and there's a lot I want to get to. So I always set it up so that there can be a season two. Like, we can leave for a bit and we can come back. It's what I was setting up with Eden's Grove. Just Eden's Grove became less fun to do because of the coronavirus. Uh, and it was, like, in a darker, less fun place when where we left it. Mm -hmm. Which is why yeah. we're yeah. doing things like uh, patrons and a DD and d game that's, like, high fantasy, high adventure, stuff like that. And in a world that's basically doing its own revival from its own apocalypse. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not, um... Yeah. We aren't facing the apocalypse, it already happened. Yeah, um, literally there's a party of adventurers that rule over the lowest. Um, <laughs> they, uh, that, there's like level 20 plus adventurers down there that is like mm. just ruling hell. Um, because they, they did their, uh, we want to play an evil campaign. <laughs> and they, <laughs> and they went down and they, uh, D&D &D lore has a group of gods that I really like. Um, that basically the backstory for three, these three gods were that they were evil adventurers who grew so powerful that at the end of their adventure that they just became like evil gods. Like that was their goal. Um, and now they're just like evil gods forever. Um, personally, I like to think that this was like a real campaign that Gary Gygax ran at some point for like some people and liked the the evil campaign so much that he just decided to like include it in the world lore because of how specific and how evil campaign formula it sounds. Um, and so that was kind of my inspiration for like, this group of four adventurers that looked at each other and they were like, what if we went and we killed Satan, but then twist, we were Satan. What if we, we, we did that. And uh, then they did. <laughs> <laughs> and then they did. I'm really glad that uh, Rowan enjoyed me talking about uh, the cosmology <laughs> of this world. <laughs> It's really good. It yeah. is very good, Riley. You are, as always, are a phenomenal storyteller and uh, get us hyped. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I really like yeah, that. So. <laughs> Especially considering how much time you took I, on this, too. Oh my I have more notes on my phone than all the documents you are looking at in the Google Doc folder oh, that I shared. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, I am. I talk about denominational disagreements inside the churches, not just between the different nations, because the different nations have different interpretations of the gods, but also denominational disagreements within the church. Oh yeah, and in a nation like 
there are two different orders of uh, human paladins from Libertina that worship Godric, and they hate each other. <laughs> <laughs> because they both believe that they are worshipping Godric the right way, and that the other group is not. And they are forced to work together because they are inside the same nation, and they're both part of the nation's army. Um, but they're not friends. <laughs> like, stuff like that. And just so you, the audience, know, Riley sends these things into our, our chats. Mm -hmm. So we get, like, tidbits. I do my best to keep people informed. <laughs> Riley's very bad at not spoiling his own campaigns, too, mm. I will say. I've done my best to not, like, reveal the missions or the plot hooks or yeah. anything like that. But I will say that I did reveal ahead of time that um, Sylph and a demon lord had a messy hookup, which resulted in moth people. And then they broke up about it and <laughs> it's put the entirety of the planet in a weird, awkward situation. <laughs> Uh, yeah. You know, just episode one stuff. Yeah, episode one <laughs> yeah. stuff. Um, oops, there's moth people now. <sighs> yep. Oops, all moths. Uh, our, our mascot of the of the podcast is, it's is a mothman. Moth so yeah. I figured it, it, we should put mothman in not every season we do. As many as we can. a lot of seasons we do. Um, yeah. I've been thinking of... Which is exactly what I wanted. I've been thinking of moth mechs for bypass system. Oh Riley, my no. gosh. Yes. But, um, yes. Right now we're focusing on D&D. &D. It should... <laughs> I was about to start brainstorming. I was going to be like, it should be its own like secret agent division. Yes. Where they have new secret forces <laughs> and yes. everyone... Dream Max. Guys, this is for D&D, &D, not <laughs> yes. Bypass. I know. Um, <laughs> Man, guys, let's go back to Bypass system. <laughs> <laughs> it was a choice Riley. between D and D, like, like a new D and D campaign, or going back to bypass system, and um, we were tired of one shots, and I wanted to do a few more world building, establishing one shots before we went back to bypass system. So I think the next campaign and the next season I run will be bypass system for sure. Um, yeah. And then yeah. after that, I'm out of campaigns that I want to run. <laughs> yeah, the rest of us do have campaign ideas. Yeah. 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 Um, this is not the lunch break. Let's not cover our other campaigns. <laughs> it warms my heart so much how much you guys love me talking for half an hour about <laughs> world building. Thank you for being my friends. Experience listeners, it's end credits time. I know you love hearing this part, but I like to remind you guys that you can find us on Tumblr, Instagram, and even TikTok. And if you like to buy the music, you can buy it all at markexperience.bandcamp.com. We also have a constantly growing collection of merch at redbubble.com slash people slash mark dash experience, where you can buy posters and shirts and stickers and all that. If you want to support your favorite editor and musician, you can head over to my coffee account at coffee.com slash Jamie Remy. That's spelled J-A-M-I-E-R-E-M-Y. Mark Experience can be located basically anywhere podcasts exist now, so you can listen wherever's easiest. See you next episode!